genius springs up from the darndest places. It can even spring up from the Calio projects in New Orleans. That's not Calliope in New Orleans, it's Calio. <laughs> and I'm with an American genius today, music. His name is Aaron Neville. And Aaron, welcome to Louisiana Legends. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure We're in a beautiful here. setting here in the Court of Commanders. Yeah, no, I like it. I this is just... a far piece from those projects, huh? Yes, it is. What was it like growing up in the projects? Uh, well, when me and my brothers were growing up in the Calliope, it was a brand new place, like back in the, in the early 40s. And it was like, to us, that was the only thing we knew. It was like uh, the world, you know, we had a big area to play in and, you know, it was like, uh, it was great, you know, it was just great. What, what, did the problems that exist now, were they very prevalent then? No, it's like night and day, really, you know. It's uh, like I wouldn't want to be a child growing up today. I don't envy a child, you know, that's got to grow up in these times, you know. Pretty rough. Yeah. Uh, as you can see, Aaron does not look like an artist. <laughs> Certainly not a musical artist. Aaron looks like someone that the New Orleans Saints could use at linebacker <laughs> or Saturday afternoon wrestling uh, uh, could use him. But in fact, he has a lovely voice and uh, his speeches belie it. Aaron, uh, I read where you said that some of your friends had been killed, were in jail. How, how did you and your brothers escape that existence? Well, I guess music had a lot to do with it, you know. Because like when we were coming up in, in the Calio Project, they had like gangs back there in those days, but it was like fighting gangs. It wasn't like the day where you get, you know, people get shot up sitting out on the porch or anything. If somebody had a disagreement, they had a fight, and you know, the next day they was playing basketball together, you know. And uh, we were a singing gang. We liked to sing, you know. So like, and uh, re regardless of what was going on back in the 40s and 50s, it didn't matter because like, as long as I could sing and sound like Nat King Cole or a Pookie Hudson and the Spaniards and the Flamingos. That was all that mattered, you know. Music was like a, a medicine. And show business was in your background. Your, I believe your mother and your uncle were a dance team. But before we were born, they were a dance and song team, and like uh, they were scheduled to go out on the road with uh, Louis Prima. My goodness. And my grandmother wouldn't let them go, so, you know. <laughs> Maybe if they'd have went, they might not be the Neville brothers, so, you That's know, right. they had to give up their dream, you know. Dreams are kind of hard to come by, though. Uh, uh, you were a house painter, a ditch digger, a truck driver, a freight handler, and worked in steel mills. Long Sherman. Well, not a steel mill, but like, uh, what's it called? It? Just where they make, uh, what's it called? Ironwork places Ironworks, like yeah. that. Yeah, you know. Aaron, you've got the most interesting earring. Now, we're used to artists with earrings, but I believe your earring contains St. Jude, and he is a saint of the hopeless, Thank the impossible. Us. Right. Have you had some hopeless and impossible moments in your own life? In other words, is that earring strongly symbolic to you? Yes, it is. That's why I wear it. You know, like, um, I feel like I've witnessed miracles. I feel like I am a miracle, you know. But like I said, I've seen, you know, a lot of my friends uh, fall by the wayside, you know, and like, uh, all I can say is, there I go I, but for the grace of God, you know, and my faith in God and and prayers and all I think just uh, brought me through, you know. Have you always had that strong religious feeling and did that come from your, your, your family? Yes, it did. Um, I was raised, I went to Catholic school from first to eighth grade and um, well, my mother was Catholic and my father was Methodist, so we had both religions. We went to Catholic church and uh, Methodist. And so like we heard the, um, but anyway, to get back to the religion thing, I I feel like uh, going to St. Monica's school, it, it gave me morals, it gave me something, it gave me something to believe in, you know? And I always look back at that, and I'm, I'm thankful for it. Matter of fact, I met my fourth grade teacher, who was a nun, Sister Damien. We met her in uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, she remembered us and remembered everybody in, that was in school back in them days. Right. And, and I was telling her that it, uh, it just, by, by us going to that school and, and getting these value, values and morals and stuff, you know, it just went with us through life. And my mother was real religious, and she's the one turned me on to St. Jude. 
you know, she knew I was going to change that one time, and she told me to go to uh, St. Jude Novena, which is going on right now, and uh, a place called St. Anne's Shrine, which is down on Ursuline and Johnson, where you go up the steps on your knees. And uh, I started doing that, you know, and just praying, you know, and it's like, uh, say God might not answer your prayers right when you ask for them, but whenever he does, it's right on time, so, you know. Have you had some moments in your life when uh, uh, you were about to give up, Aaron? Well, I thought of it, you know, like, uh, it was like, seemed like a hopeless thing at one time, you know, but something in me, like I see a lot of my friends, I, when I sing now, I sing for them, because I felt like I made it because I had a song, that's what I call it, I could sing, you know, I had a gift from God, you know, and uh, at times when I did think about that it wasn't going to happen or something, you know, something in me would just give me the courage to just go on, you know, just take whatever was, you know. Another friend of mine, his name is Skip, he was an engineer at Cosmo Matassa's uh, recording studio back in the day. And he'd see the change I was going through with the record companies and all. I was, you know, recording. I wasn't getting paid nothing, just like the average um, artist back in them days, you know. And he'd tell me, say, Aaron, patience is a virtue. <laughs> I didn't really know what he meant at the time, you know, but yes. I, over the years I, I learned, you know. And so that was one thing I wanted to say when I got to my first Grammy. I wanted to say, Skip, patience is a virtue, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like to get that Grammy? That must have been some... Oh, it was a great feeling. Like, I'd been watching the Grammys for years, you know, and had my speech all made out and everything, you know. And when I finally got there, I felt like Ralph crammed him, you know. I couldn't say nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm. <laughs> Aaron, who were the early artists who had a, a, a definite influence on you and your style? First of all, I have to say my brother Art. He was my first influence. He had a doo-wop group, you know. And uh, then my, my father would have all the Nat King, everything Nat King Cole had. It was my... My mother and my father's favorite singer. And uh, I would try to sing like Nat. And, and you could do the high parts, though, couldn't you? Yeah. And and that's what always fascinated me about the doo-wops, you know, like the the old groups like Clyde McFadden, the Billy Ward and the Dominoes, Sonny Till and the Oreos and all that, you know. It was just, uh, they had the bass singer, they had the three fellas in the middle singing the harmonies, and the one said, ah, you know. Right, sense of <laughs> and I, I read another interesting thing that struck me. It's just wonderful. Some of those uh, 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 cowboys who yodeled. Hoodily, hoodily, hoodily. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> That's wonderful. Aaron, uh, at what point you sang, but a lot of kids sang, at what point did, uh, did it suddenly dawn on you, or did somebody tell you that you could be the real thing, that you could be a professional singer? Not a great professional singer, which you've turned out, but a pro. Well, it never was anything to talk about like that, but people would tell me they liked, you know, how it sounded. You know, matter of fact, I used to sing my way into the movies and basketball games or whatever. Who was at the door, I'd sing for them, and they'd let me in. <laughs> so I figured something was happening then, you know. <laughs> That's a great story. Yeah. Tell me about your relationship with your brothers. You all are very close, huh? Yeah. We grew up together, you know, like we were like kids, and, you know, my oldest brother, Art, He'd, he'd beat us up, you know, back in them days, but he wouldn't let nobody else mess with us, you know, like if anybody would come around and want to fight, we'd call Art, and Art was the... <laughs> but now I'm bigger than him now. he had have to call me. <laughs> <laughs> you and, uh, said that uh, when you look at your brothers, you see the images of people who've gone on in the family. You... Yeah, I can, you know, like we're on stage, I can look at Cyril or sometime or Art or Charles, either one, I can see somebody in my family that's not here anymore, they're still living within us, and they do the same thing, you know, so. And y'all are very close, huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we like the, the patriots, you know, we the, what you would call it, uh, we the head of the families now, you know. What was the first big break you all got that uh, kind of gave you a little nudge along the way? When, at what point did you stop being a nice local group and show some real potential nationally and even internationally? Uh, was, with 1966, I had to tell it like it is. And that was like um, uh, the biggest, my, it went to number one, you know, and all. I didn't get paid for it, but it was, you know. Good experience. Yeah. You know, I got to sing at the Apollo Theater and got to do a lot of traveling. I traveled with Otis Redden before he died and 
a lot of big stars, you know. And as you witness a lot of these stars uh, wreck themselves and squander their talent with dope and other excesses, did that did that make a, a strong impression on you? Did it do something to you? Yeah, it definitely did. It, it let me know what is all what is what is all about. You know, it was like um, the talent is something that God gives you, and it's not nothing to just you know. Uh, misuse anything, you know, like people would tell me like, well, man, you should have made it big when Tell Like It Is came out, you know, I thank God knew what he was doing, you know, because like, I don't know if I could have handled you it, handled you know, it. Right. so uh, I just took it as it came, you know, and so, said, hey, at that time, I, I, I sang for like most of 67 and, and I, after the record died down, I came back to New Orleans and started working with my brothers again at clubs, you know, on the weekends, and uh, during the week, I'd work at another job, you know, to feed the family. Just a regular job? Yeah. And like, um, like I say, you know, it, it took who I was and where I come from to make me who I am. You know, all the things I saw that, that happened to other people, you know, it made me just take life more dearly and, and respect life and respect I, myself. I have a feeling, in fact, it's written in your eyes, I, I mean this, that you've seen a lot of life. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of experience in your face. Yeah, well, and I'm here, you know, like I say, I'm here to, to, to talk about it and and uh, what didn't happen to me, I've seen it happen to other people, you know, and uh, it could have been me. You don't smoke or drink? No, I did, I smoked and drank, I quit everything about 1981, my, my uncle, who was a big chief jolly of the Wild Chapatulas, he died of lung cancer, and I was in the hospital with him like three months watching him die, and that just made me don't want to smoke. He was a fabulous character. He huh? was, yeah. He was like, uh, you had to know him, you know. And they called him Jolly. And that was, uh, my, my mother and him, I guess, started calling him. He's always a Jolly cat, you know. Did he have some influence on y'all? Oh, big influence, yeah. He was the one, the first one that started, because he was a piano player, too. And he'd come around and, and we'd see him play piano and we'd be trying. That was the first thing that I ever, tried to play piano. I looked, watch his hands and, you know, see what he'd done and just copied him. Aaron, what, what does New Orleans mean to you? Do you, do you? How do you feel about it? Do you like to come back to it? I love New Orleans. It's like, um, you know, I get to see a lot of beautiful places, you know, and people always ask me, hey, man, uh, what's the most beautiful place you've been or whatever, you know? I said, well, I've been to Switzerland, I've been to France, I've been to New Zealand, uh, Australia, uh, I see, but out of all them beautiful places, the most beautiful sight to me is when I'm coming in on the plane and look down and see the swamps. <laughs> I see, well, I know where I'm at now, you know. How about the food here? Oh, I love the food, you know, but... Who wouldn't, huh? Yeah. And then my wife and my mother-in-law, they're great cooks. And being on the road, you got to eat in restaurants a lot, you know, so I don't get a chance to do that much in New Orleans, but I've, I've eaten here at Commander's Palace, and it's great. You were telling me about life on the road. It's not quite so as exciting as most <laughs> of us would think, huh? Uh, uh, tell the folks uh, uh, what you do after a performance. Well, now, he's just sung for X thousands of people, and they're screaming and cheering, and now we say, well, Aaron Neville must have big plans. The night's over, he can relax. Tell us how you relax. Well, when I don't have to get on the bus and ride 10 hours, I'll go back <laughs> to the hotel and... and and hopefully I can catch uh, the honeymoon or something like that on TV before I go to sleep. <laughs> so much for the exciting life, huh? Uh, the exciting part is on stage watching the people scream and all that. That's, that's the exciting part of it. The rest of it, if they could come up with something like Star Trek, you know, and beam you from your house <laughs> yes. to, the, to the stage and back, it'd be good. It's a job, huh? Well, it's a job, but I love it, you know. Aaron, is it tough to produce a hit? How much of it is luck? How much of it is talent? I mean, for a song, uh, 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 you'll do dozens, you'll record dozens of songs, and you sing uh, to international audiences. What does it take to suddenly, ping, hit that, that magic thing that people call a hit? The thing about it, you never know until it happens, you know? Because a song can sound like a hit, and if it don't get the airplay, and uh, if the people can't hear it, they can't hit. You know, it could be a dead hit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've never heard that before. <laughs> Aaron, uh, 
How was it to sing at the world famous Apollo, which is supposed to be the toughest audience in the world? They don't like it. They boo you off the stage. Oh yeah, they throw tomatoes. They throw tomatoes and eggs and all that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. That was they kept us uh, an extra week. We, we played Christmas of 1966, and it was a uh, the show was so good they kept it over for another for two weeks. How much are you on the road? Most of the time. Is that right? Yeah, we like the Neville Brothers. We travel like. Uh, at least seven, eight months out of the year, yeah. You know. For example, uh, uh, we're coming into November as we tape this. What's upcoming on your schedule? I'm just curious. Well, I'm leaving um, Sunday to go to L.A. to do a Christmas special with Harry Connick Jr. And uh, I come home that Monday night, and next week I go to China for a week. China? Yeah. That'll be an experience, huh? Yeah. I've been to Japan. It's the first time going to China. So How'd you like Japan? Japan is great, yeah. We've Were the audiences good? Oh, yeah, definitely. i tell you what about Japan. The audience in Japan, they know more about the musicians and singers from New Orleans than some of the people that live here. Is that right? Definitely. They just love our culture. Oh, yeah. Aaron, uh, you define success in a unique way. I love it. You said being together as brothers, still looking out for each other yeah well like you know um success is um it's not always being rich and famous and nothing like that it's being having peace of mind and you know and can still be together. like i said me and my brothers we're together and we're looking out for each other and uh, so you'll never be alone yeah there you go as I remarked earlier, Aaron looks like uh, uh, he could replace <laughs> Sam Mills during Sam's absence in the center of the Saints' uh, uh, linebacking corps. How much do you work out? Uh, I try to do something every day. Like, I work out at the Uptown Health Club on Magazine Street, and my trainer, her name is Tazzy Colomb. She's like a bodybuilder, you know, and she's great. She's, if you see her arms, big as mine, <laughs> you know, and she's a real uh, inspiration for me, you know. You. So she shows me the right things to do. So when I'm on the road, most of the hotels have fitness centers, you know, and we bring weights on the truck. And uh, cause I love it, you know, it's like build, building my body, you know. Linda Ronstadt has played a, 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 a major role in, in your unique success, and uh, uh, you've done lots for her too. How did that come about? Uh, she was here in 1984 for the World's Fair with Nelson Riddle. And, uh, after her show, she came to see the Neville Brothers. And somebody told me she was in the audience, so I called up on stage to sing some doo-wop. And she came up and she told the press later on that that was the highlights of her tour. She felt like Cinderella at the ball. She got to sing with her favorite band. And I asked for an autograph, and she said, to Aaron, love, I'll sing with you anytime, any place, anywhere. And about a year later, um, I called her to come down and do our homeless and hungry benefit that we have, the New Orleans Audits Against Hunger and Homeless. And she came down for that, and that was the first chance we had to, like, sit down and just sing and see how well our voices blended. And we started talking about recording, and um, it took, you know, a few years because of our different schedules, because the Neville was always on the road, and she was always on the road. So we finally hooked up in, like, 1988, that made that and and record it and uh now I, I talked to her still talked to her and uh, we're talking about doing some more stuff together do you do a lot of writing yeah you know like i at one time i was writing i got a poetry a book of poetry you know but i can't just sit down and say i'm gonna write you know i have to, I have to be inspired you know i might be in my car Spontaneous, yeah, it just has and to come, to, come to me, you know. But lyrics, you think in terms of lyrics? Lyrics and and poetry. It it comes in a sort of like a, a musical poetry, you know, because a lot of the uh, few of my po poems I use on uh, my records, you know. So Does that happen to you recently, where some lines just begin to flow? Yeah, you know, and if you don't have something to write it down right then, uh, you know, it just goes and maybe somebody else will pick it up, you know, goes through the airwaves. What's, uh, what's it like to be a star? 
<laughs> I don't know. Oh, of course you do. Oh, there's no time for modesty. What, 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 what's it like to be, all right, let me help you out. What's it like to be Aaron Neville? <laughs> oh, it's, it's great, you know, like, um, especially here in New Orleans, it's like, when I go somewhere like a mall or something like that, you know, the people in New Orleans, I'm theirs, you know. Like, you know, I don't know them, you know, but they know me. So, like, hey, Aaron, hey, how you doing? You know, I, got, I make like I know them too, you know, like, hey, that's home, you know. Or uh, if it's on the road, somewhere it's in the airport, you know, people recognize me. It's, it's fun, you know. I find it fascinating that most of the great artists that New Orleans has produced, Al Hurt, Pete Fountain, yourself, Harry Connick Jr., y'all all keep that strong identification with this city and this state. There's something good here, huh? Oh, um, like New Orleans is, uh, everywhere we go, people want to come here, you know. As a matter of fact, you, you see a lot of, uh, stars moving, buying houses down, you know. Linda Ron said it, talked about it. I don't know if she's still going to do it. Maria Maldua, she's from California. She just bought a house. Jimmy Buffett just, o just opened up to Margaritaville, and um, the director, uh, ha uh, Taylor Hackford, yes. he's, he's bought a house down here. And just, hey, New Orleans is a special place. A very special place. Uh, uh, in the traveling that I've done, there's nothing like it. Oh, no. Someday when uh, this uh, uh, is beginning to fade uh, uh, and that those beautiful notes, those, that falsetto uh, uh, doesn't come quite so easily, what do you want to do with yourself? What, how, how, when you call it a day and relax, and what, 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 would, what would you like to do? I'd just like to be able to lay back and watch my grandkids grow up and, you know, try to uh, point them in the right direction, you know, and do whatever I can to help to make it a better world, you know, and... You're a social activist, aren't you? I mean, like the hungry and the homeless. You feel very strongly about things, do you not? Yeah, well, I've been hungry, you know, and like, uh, nobody feels, and I just see people out there, and I say, wow, you know, I, I miss meal for like a few hours, and I got stomach cramps, and I just say, hey, this cat might not have eaten for a few days or something, you know. So if I can help, because I always say, there go I, but for the grace of God, it could be me sitting out there, you know. And hey, why not help? You're really conscious of the past, aren't you, Aaron? Well, it's, kind of, it's really ingrained in you. Yeah, well, like I say, the past bring, makes the future, you know, and the present. It took who I was and where I come from, what I saw, to make me who I am. Well, Aaron, it's, it's uh, been wonderful uh, talking to you, with you. Uh, your day-to-day, -day, you were uh, interviewed for the Grammy Awards, were you not? You've yeah. already done an interview. And uh, now we're here in the courtyard of Commanders, which is like a movie setting. Yeah, I was no. looking at that oak, which is just glorious. I was just wondering about how old is it? Well, it, it, it's about my age, but a little younger than you. <laughs> uh, Aaron, uh, and now from here you go to a funeral. Yeah, a friend of mine died um, Monday, and he's like part of my family, you know. And how will you spend the evening? Do you have work, or will you be able to relax? I'll be relaxed after that. We go home and, you know, um, probably see some of my grandkids, you know. How many grandchildren do you have? I have five and one on the way. Is there any singing in the next generation? Oh, yeah. Like, um, well, my sons, all of them, are uh, in music. And um, one of my grandsons, he's a... Sportsman. He's a baseball player and a football player. I have one grandson. He's a drummer. And uh, the rest of them too young. I don't know what they're going to do, you know. But Do you like to play gigs in New Orleans here in your hometown? Tipitinas. Tipitinas. Yeah, we play. As a matter of fact, we're playing there the 5th and the 6th of November. And you'll enjoy that? Oh, yeah. Is it a different audience here in New Orleans? Yeah, no, no audience like New Orleans. How so? It's just uh, New Orleans got its own attitude, its own, you know atmosphere and, and like because we bring that everywhere we go we bring new orleans with us you know we like ambassadors of new orleans you know we bring it to japan or australia and new zealand or wherever you know and people like i say when people come to new orleans they look for tipitinas and they always want to see us there but we got to get out on the road and make a living you make know we living. can't just sit you know aaron you appear to me to be a great artist who's very much at peace with himself and that is very enviable particularly in in, in your high estate. It's quite an accomplishment. Yeah, well, you know, I read something somewhere, you know, like, people say, oh, man, you must be rich in this and that, you know. I say, I feel rich. 
I don't know, I might not be wealthy, but I feel rich because like I'm still doing what I love to do and I'm with my family and all, you know. And I read something by a fellow named Og Mandino in yes. one of his books. He said, uh, he is not poor who has little, only he who desires much. And true security does not lie in the things one has, but in the things one can do without. Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Neville. Thank you for sharing it with Louisiana Legends. Thank you. All right. Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years.